we have our esteemed panelist here uh, ready to take any questions that you might have. If you'll post them in the uh, question and answer portion of the um, of the webinar, uh, we'll be we will get to them. Um, I have I have a couple to start. We had a couple that came in earlier uh, after some after a couple of presentations. Um, we'll start with the uh, <laughs> the the philosophical one first. So Adam, get ready. Uh, the, this is the question is, where does the argument that humans, since they have the capacity to reduce human misery, but also improve animal lives, have the responsibility to act upon it, even if it means the use of animals that do not have that ability. Is this consequentialist, consequentialistic approach or speciesism? Hmm. So I think um, in ethics, we distinguish sometimes between who's the uh, patient of an ethical action and who's the uh, agent, which sounds sort of technical, but the, the patient is the being or person who's affected by an action and the agent is who's, who's making the decision. And so I think a lot of when we're talking about consequentialism or non-consequentialism, that's more focused on what you should be doing if you're already um, a moral agent who, who has a responsibility to make decisions. Um, so I, I don't think it, the, this question of who has the responsibility that cleanly fits into those, those buckets, but um, a lot of people have made the argument over years that, you know, human, of course, are, uh, are unique in our cognitive abilities. And so we have uh, unique responsibilities as uh, as moral agents uh, that other animals don't don't have. So I don't know if anyone else wanted to add anything to that. <laughs> uh, the next question I have is for uh, Dr. France. Um, and that is that um, we, there are uh, different levels of, of our access to social or our ability to post on social media. One being, uh, I have a personal page I have a laboratory page and my institution also has pages. Um, so uh, do you have any advice as to like, if I have my personal page, should I create a lab page where I post most of my, most of my scientific stuff and just keep my personal page separate? Um, and then my institution obviously has their own rules and I will have to submit to someone probably. Yeah, good question. I think it depends on the institution with how much you need to have approval on what you're posting and, and it depends on what you're sharing as well. I think having a, your lab page, having a page that is devoted to what you're working on, your science, is a great idea. Um, it can be linked to a website. It really can be focused, have a lot of facts about what you're doing um, and you have a lot more control over that. But I don't think necessarily keeping that separate. I think you can share your the information that you have on your lab page than on your personal page because you've likely have different audiences with both of them, and we need to be reaching all of them. Um, yes, you of course need to abide by your institutional rules, um, but I think a lot of institutions are becoming more and more comfortable talking about animals in research. I know Emory is a great example of one that now shares all of their Brad events. They, on their on the official Emory University page, they share photos and talk about Brad. Um, so I think it's, it's a movement that we need to keep doing, and if we do it little by little on our personal pages and on our lab pages, uh, then our institutions will join us as well. So yesterday we learned about the eight second rule. Um, how can we effectively communicate ethics by fo following that eight second rule? <laughs> <laughs> Don't start your timer yet. I'm still thinking. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, I mean, obviously there's, there's tension between the academic practice of thinking long and hard about um, certain topics and, uh, and the goal of communicating effectively with the public. And so I think if you only have eight seconds, you just need to hope that you have, uh, that you have a value that already resonates with people and, uh, and tap into that value. So I don't know, other people might have different views. Take a swing at that and it won't be eight seconds to use them up. Um, so I think one way to do it is to say, 
decisions are going to be made. Actions are going to be taken. They'll affect you or involve you. Can we talk about it? Like, literally, would you like to talk about it? Mm -hmm. And the reason I think that gets you into ethics is the immediate question is, what's the decision? What's going to happen? Who's affected? Who benefits? Who's harmed? What, what will have to be done? which gets you into an inclusive conversation that isn't about my values or your values. It's things will happen, whether we do something or not. Let's talk about how those might happen, what our values are. That wasn't eight seconds. <laughs> Who else wants to swing in? So also probably not going to be eight seconds. I've been thinking about this since yesterday and lost sleep over it clearly. But I think from my standpoint as a lab animal vet, usually, especially if we're having this conversation of ethics and how can you be a vet and still condone animal research, my my the way I say it, and maybe this isn't really an ethical, but just a personal, I always just tell them at the end of the day, I know where I stand morally. And I know that animals will be used in research and I want to be the ones to protect them. And I kind of leave it at that and I let them kind of take away whatever they want from it. Yeah, and I think one of the things too that we may have learned is you have eight seconds to grab their attention to get to the next eight seconds, you know, so yeah. Um, there's a, a comment and a question in the in the chat. Uh, and it's about Temple Grandin and work that she's done on humane treatment of animals and maintaining open dialogue with the public and how well she's done with that. Um, and understanding that, uh, that you know, she advocates uh, non-anthropomorphic -anthrop understanding of animals' perspective um, and how they communicate and, and how that can guide decisions. Um, should we use more of work like that to highlight, be highlighted in our discussions about research. And he mentioned that Nicole alluded to that idea in her session. Any thoughts, comments? So that's a, that's a great um, point. And actually at Marshall, we worked with, uh, um, with a behaviorist who was a student of Temple Grandin's. And um, so it was great. And I think that that's a really important point um, in considering how we're looking at animals. I can give an example, just working with the pigs that we were always very conscious about the way that they see and approaching them um, in a very specific way because their eyes are at the sides of their head. So we would go low and go to the side, make sure they could see us. So I think that um, that is, is something that we should be when we're talking about um, and we're talking about ethics and we're talking about what's best for the animal that we should be um, paying attention to the animal's perspective. We do that with um, ferrets and cats too. They like to have a vertical environment and sometimes we can forget about that because we're used to just having a horizontal environment and, and room to climb and room to explore. So I think that's an excellent point. So I'm gonna change topics just a little bit. Um, Yesterday, we talked about how veterinarians are such a trusted source of information, um, but we don't always hear from them in, in, other, in the, the venues that reach the public. Um, what do you all have to say about how we can further veterinarians' participation and reach in that space? Yeah, I'll take this one first. So for me, what I think is um, visibility within the veterinary community is a great place to start in creating those allies. This means that the lab animal vets need to talk to their veterinary colleagues because as we have mentioned, there, there isn't always that understanding. Um, but you know, your universities are great places to start because your clinicians are doing animal trials or animal research and the bridging of the gap happens right there at that level. And, and what a great way to start and to ease into that, that bigger discussion to get people involved and get all veterinarians at a similar understanding of what we as lab animal vets do. And I think talking about the um, role of animal research and how it benefits animals and how it allows veterinarians to practice medicine and making sure that they understand that. And it starts at, it starts young, K through 12. I mean, we need to start getting in there, but it also in vet school. I mean, there is more of a focus on making sure veterinary students are aware of different career opportunities and understand the role of these different fields in veterinary medicine as a whole. Um, so there are lots of approaches and tactics. We try to get Brad, when we have multiple vet, in, vet uh, 
clinics that participate in Brad, and we have pamphlets and handouts that are really targeting their clients that say we have a treatment for heartworm because of research in dogs or because of X, Y, and Z. Um, so lots of approaches I think need to be done in order to make sure that they are contributing to this message. Um, I have a question for Samar. So we've been talking a lot today about, about the openness initiative and that's an actual thing. And then about all of us being more open from, from a media point of view, does that help you? Does, how do you feel? I mean, where does that sit with you as a... I mean, I, I'm very grateful for when things are a lot more open. It makes my job easier. It makes a fellow journalist's job easier. Um, and I think, I think the, I just want to underscore the importance of openness, right? There's this idea that if you say nothing um, on, a, on a topic, right, you're staying neutral. Um, but no, the reality is if you say nothing on a topic, right, uh, the worst of what's already out there is the official party line without um, any, um, any of your side, with any pushback. So I think that's ultimately that's important for the public. It's important for journalists as well, right? If I can't get someone to refute what uh, some animal rights group is saying or give me another another idea, another um, strain of thought, right? Then I'm just going to publish what the animal rights group said and said, I tried to reach out to scientists, but they did not comment, right? <laughs> they, they didn't respond to my uh, calls, right? So it is, I mean, obviously talking to the media will always have risk. Talk, I mean, because there will always be the risk of being misquoted. Um, and there's ways to manage that. So if, for example, we spoke about journalists who maybe come from organizations or outlets that focus exclusively on animal rights and uh, they might not be as friendly to your position. I still think it's worth engaging them, but maybe instead of having a telephone interview where you're worried about um, things going out of control, being taken out of context, you send an email statement, right? Where it's very clear you said this and then uh, both sides know exactly what's been said. So I think it is, uh, openness is, is great for everyone because I think it helps the public get a sense of what uh, what are these faceless scientists doing. Um, and it also gives the media an opportunity to engage. I mean, something I wanted to mention on the last question is for veterinarians. Um, what, what can they do? Well, one thing is to become friends with the journalists, right? F find out who the journalists are at your local paper, who the science journalists are, get to know them, offer yourself as a resource. Uh, just because uh, you might not be quoted in a piece, uh, that it's always nice to be quoted sometimes, uh, but it is something where if you can be a resource, if you can help someone out, um, journalists can be very appreciative and you can help me ensure the media stories are better quality for it. Um, in the room, Dr. Wall. So I have a question for Dr. France. Um, I'm totally overwhelmed by what you <laughs> described about social media. Um, but, and I'm, I'm stuck on the things we want to communicate effectively about science. The, the big deal is that we want to convey the nuance and the complexity and all of that stuff. And that seems sort of fundamentally um, incompatible with the, the short, clear, um, clean messages. Is it appropriate to say that the idea is to have lots and lots of those short messages that that we get to the nuance that way or i think that's definitely an approach and and maybe the most appropriate approach these days we know that we aren't going to have someone stay on our post for a long time and read a whole big caption on something so giving bite-sized pieces more frequently um if you talk to some of these companies that are really, really on it with social media, they'll have that every day they're posting three different posts, for example. Um, and yeah, that can feel overwhelming for someone. Don't make that your goal and don't be overwhelmed and we'll talk after, but there are lots of ways for you to do it that really give people little bits of information and slowly we're moving the needle a little bit. Um, so, but I, I know what you're saying in terms of the, we're trying to convey something that is so complex, but we don't have the attention span of someone who can understand that and listen. So yes, bite size, little bits. Good question. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Lundy. I'm going to come back to my question for Adam. Um, I, you know, I have very mixed um, thoughts about speciesism, but we know that Peter Singer's book that was re-released uh, is, in my mind, I've distilled it down that the reason we do, whether you want to label them bad things, needed things, whatever, is because we're speciest. We feel that as humans, we have um, 
domination, stewardship, whatever term you want to use over non-humans, even though we're all animals. Um, do you have any thoughts? I, I do remember that Peter said that he thought sentience stopped at shrimp, that shrimp had sentience and mussels didn't. And I, you know, I really don't know how what, what to do with that information, but um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. About speciesism in particular, or the sort of where you draw the line with uh, sentience. Um, <clears throat> there's been, what's that? Oh, okay. I think, I think I need to speak closer. Um, so there's been interesting research uh, from London School of Economics. They have a group that looks at um, consciousness in different species. And so they've been publishing interesting stuff about different invertebrates. Um, so I'll just say that quickly. But speciesism, I think, is a really interesting topic because um, the way that it was defined by Singer um, is making decisions purely on uh, the basis of species membership. And so I guess as an ethicist who's kind of studied that, I, I, I think it's interesting because some people say, oh yeah, I'm proudly a speciesist or you know, I, I'm definitely a speciesist because I think humans should get priority. Um, but what's interesting is if you're making that decision based on some capacity that you think humans have, like cognitive capacity or the ability to form social agreements or uh, whatever else, um, then it technically is not speciesist according to the original definition. So. Uh, so I think people kind of use it in, in different ways sometimes. Um, but to me, where it is could be viewed as a criticism is if you're only looking at species as a reason for treating one being less than the other, and there's not some other characteristic that you can point to, like increased capacity to feel pain or you know the ability to form preferences about the future. So yeah. So you're saying that there's commonality between species, like, you know, the, 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 the groupings, whether you call them murder of crows or a pack of wolves or whatever, you know, a conglomeration of humans. Um, so you're, if you're going to claim to be a species, there has to be something that no other species demonstrates. Is that what you're saying? Um, I mean, I guess in the world we live in it would just you know there are lots of capacities that humans have that other species don't have um and if you think that those capacities are kind of what gives moral standing or gives an increased reason to treat humans differently um then i i think it wouldn't be speciesist according to that original technical definition but yeah dr newsom uh, two questions, one for Dr. Yates. Um, if an investigator or researcher is targeted, uh, should institutions have resources available to assist them or be prepared for, for such targeting? We do. At our institution, and in all, all institutions should, they should be able to support people in terms of security. Now, some people have asked, can uh, the university police department go out and protect their home? In our community, they're not legally allowed to, but they can interface with our local law enforcement and help out in that way and just alert our local law enforcement that this person may be targeted. We tell, for example, an investigator if they are, if there is a demonstration at their home, and it may actually be a completely legal demonstration because people actually do have the right to protest in front of your home if they do it legally, but uh, to alert the university police department and they'll call the local police department and emphasize the importance of this particular event. So there's a number of things that we do. We give security advice to people as well in terms of how to protect themselves in their home. We also tell uh, them if there are any direct threats, let us know of it um, immediately and our police department will promptly contact the FBI and get the FBI involved. So many things that we do to help protect people. 
Uh, one other question, if I may. Uh, this is sort of directed to Dr. Kwan, but uh, what we've learned the last two days, everybody can answer. So Dr. Kwan, you presented uh, that this animal enthusiast or animal uh, impression is, is a, a great a way to engage and, and get the message across. But from the survey, we saw that there might be as many as 30% of the people that have no knowledge about science and they don't care about animals and research. We need to engage these people. So this is for the whole, the whole community here at the table because they do have say in what our Congress and our local community members are voting on and how do we engage them? Um, because the people who care about animals, be it uh, to stop animal research or to support it, those are the people that are listening. How do we catch that middle peak that Samir showed? Uh, 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 and uh, how, do we, how do we really engage that group? It's so funny because the first thing my brain thought was, what? No, someone doesn't <laughs> like animals. And I think that's the first, um, I think that's a lot of reactions most people would have even in society because animals are such a big part of our lives. Mm -hmm. And so it's also kind of kicking back that question of when they say they don't care about science or they don't care about animals, to what capacity have they interacted with them? And there's some people out there who, for instance, they might have a farm dog. And maybe when they're answering the survey, they might not, they might not really understand. They might just be like, oh yeah, I don't know anything about science or I don't, I don't care about animals, whatever. But then they're not thinking about, oh, but my farm dog protects my sheep. And so I think it is something that we have to work on though, because there is a part of that society that has this voter ability. And I can't say I can answer that question right now, because I think that's something that all of us can work on is how do we reach these people? Because I think, again, it's the we're, we could all be animal enthusiasts, but there's different levels of enthusiasm and there's different approaches to it. Um, I mean, we were using a lot of positive examples where people keep their animals really close to their hearts. But for some people, it's a livelihood, like when we talk about livestock, um, when we talk about ranchers. And so they have a different they sort of have a different relationship with those animals doesn't mean they're not enthusiastic or they don't care about them, but maybe with how we word questions, they might not consider themselves someone who cares about animals because maybe in their mind, they're like, oh, it's a food source, but that's something that's also valuable to society. So maybe it's just re reapproaching how we think it, right? <laughs> Just to briefly add, I mean, there are certain things that are universal that people care about. And one of those things I believe is healthcare, right? And then people, I mean, everybody gets sick, everybody will die. Um, so it's the question then is that, can you reframe these discussions about animal or science, broadly speaking, right? In terms of, oh, I mean, think about your mom or dad who's had this disease, right? Oh, well, this animal research helped create a cure, right? Um, and I think it's just reframing things in terms of what people really care about. I think it's even more foundational. There's not a platform uh, that's available for the public and they wouldn't know how to reach a university if the scientists aren't out there, if the institutions aren't promoting actively what they would like to, then I think the public needs to be uh, made aware in some place. You're saying, uh, Dr. Yates was talking about uh, communications departments. So if that can happen and then a platform can be put in place, much like every other animal related issue, then I think the communication will greatly improve. Um, yeah, I, I agree along those lines. Um, public education campaigns are a great way to get the word out think um, Americans understand certain concepts better thanks to public education campaigns with billboards and ads. Um, a lot of issues can be untangled that way. Yeah, I'll agree with those and say, I was struck by the survey data that showed, I think about 80% of the people endorsed livestock. Remember 34% for it's easy to connect the consequence, hamburger, bacon, if one chooses to eat meat. If you talk about livestock, you know what the consequence is of interfering with the ability to eat meat. When you get to animal research, you have no such direct connection at all, right? It's too many different steps. So one of the reasons I think the drug labels would work 
is it's absolutely a direct connection to people who are consuming medicines for their pets, for humans. It's look, that's animal research, QR code, go find out more about it. But it's the consequence in making that connection. Yeah, and I think we too might, uh, hopefully, the last two days will help us to connect with all those people through social media, through our websites, because <laughs> the first thing people do, uh, and I know this because my mother my mother uh, has something and she Googles it. <laughs> and uh, if the University of Pittsburgh came up or whoever came up as, hey, here's a, you know, an institution that studies this exact disease, uh, and they may be able to help. Yeah. Um, listen. So we've talked briefly about how we can support one another in our efforts to communicate with the public. We have talked about how, what institutions can do to help support individuals trying to um, make these connections. Do you all think that there are other bodies that should be doing more of this? And if so, what can they do? That may that be funding agencies or nonprofits or other non-governmental organizations. <laughs> I definitely think that NIH could do more. I mean, they fund a lot of the work and they've not always been so outspoken about the benefits of animal research. They put some stuff out there, but not a lot. They certainly could do a lot more in this arena. I think that um, private industry could do more too. Um, I'm going to say it. I think that... Uh, you know, a lot of this relies on the academics and the academics are already very open. And so I think that if we could have a more united front across the entire um, research spectrum, that that could be really, really beneficial. I was just gonna say, we talk about these big, the NIH institutions, academics, contracts, but individuals, each person, we all should be doing more individually, talking to family and friends. I have a friend who, I swear, she is an animal research advocate now because she knows what I do and she tells everyone about it. So um, all of these conversations make a difference. I completely agree. And I think we've seen in other social movements, that's what transforms things is not media or anything like that, but person-to-person -person communications. You know someone who does animal research. I trust them, therefore I know it's okay. I'd like to add that um, I think what has swayed all my family and friends, and they all ask me now, is what's exciting coming out of the University of Pittsburgh? So I don't just jump right into I'm um, doing animal-based research. I start sharing the, these great discoveries, and some of them even seem like they're science fiction when, when you're telling them. So you wrap it around there, and then you can get back, well, here's how I support that. And it works really well. Candace, would you like to go? Thank you. Um, I thought it might be a good opportunity to ask Adam, uh, Smart, or Logan, is there a question that you wish we would have asked that hasn't been asked yet? I have a question. Um, is everyone aware of citizen sciences? Has anybody thought about how citizen science can be part of these communication efforts? Uh, that was actually a part of my graduate work. Um, and I wasn't as involved with it because it was at the tail end of my research, but we studied ticks and we studied where ticks occurred and we studied Lyme disease. And so what we did was that we partnered with a master's student in computer science to create an app that's called Tick Encounters. And the idea is that you're a citizen hiking in the forest and you come home and you're just covered in ticks. And so what you could do with the app is you can take the app, take a picture of the tick. It can help you identify it with some of the information coming out of, I think it's university, I'm gonna say this wrong, but it's University of New Hampshire, I think, where they actually have tick encounters and they have a kind of like, this is how you identify a tick. And the idea behind this is we wanted to understand the spatial distribution of specific species of ticks because not all ticks can transmit Lyme disease but we also wanted to see where were dogs picking them up where were humans interacting with them and the idea was sort of this bigger like idea that with the citizens help because we can't be out there as scientists dragging in the field all the time to get these ticks and so I'm not sure if other people have utilized that, but that's been something that we've been talking about, especially when I talk about research to veterinarians, 
because I think veterinarians, we are all scientists by nature, but we might not call ourselves researchers. And so one of the talks that I gave to my classmates was that I really wanted them to encourage them, even if you're going into a clinical setting, there's a lot of data you can collect with permission, of course, that you can then use to kind of forefront like, hey, you know, we noticed that a ton of our dogs had this, but we traditionally treat with this, but we tried this and just collecting that data from just your local clinics can then go and be helpful elsewhere. So I'm not sure if anyone else has experienced with citizen science this way, but that's why we've utilized it. I'm actually, I haven't heard that term before, but I experienced it a lot, especially in vet schools. And I think vet schools are pretty good at this because they have a lot of clinical trials for animals and they'll ask um, the general public, do you have a dog that meets these criteria and would like to partake in a, a clinical animal trial or veterinary students, um, do you want to enroll your own animal in a clinical trial? And um, I know plenty of friends that did that. And I think it's, it's a great stepping stone into research because it's obvious that animals in animal research, helping animals makes sense to a lot of people. And what could that lead to in their thought of, well, if animals can help animals, can animals help people? And veterinary schools already do that. And, and maybe they need to broadcast it even more, but it was very evident as a vet student. And it might be a good way to communicate to other veterinarians as well, what that research process is like, because they're already doing it. Now that um, our panelists have had a moment to think, Candace, could you repeat your question? I can. So I think one of, one of the questions that I was hoping would have been answered actually came up. Um, however, now I'm gonna go back to um, Samar and, and Adam. Is there a question you wish you had been asked or that we'd thought to ask you that we didn't, that would be valuable for other scientists listening to hear the answer to you. I mean, I, I guess I wanna reiterate something uh, about what does it mean for veterinarians, uh, these other research scientists to be friends with journalists and sort of what's the, what's the point of that? What's the importance of that? How can you do that? Um, I mean, I think it is really, for journalists, a question often comes and it's one of the difficulties is sourcing. How do you find the people to talk to, right? Often you do a Google searching, you might read other news articles on this topic, might reach out to the same people, right? Or if you're being innovative, maybe you'll reach out to the colleagues, right? Rather than the, the, the people that have been quoted themselves. Um, but the point being is that it's sourcing is difficult. Right, it's it, difficult to know who will have expertise, who will know this. Um, so journalists are in need of these friends, right? People that they can reach out, trusted, uh, who don't necessarily have a stake in them. Quoting, they don't have this sort of self-interest in that. Oh, I need to be in the article. I need to. I need to be front and center and be represented. But more that I just want to help you do good science. Um, so I think it is. It requires a proactive nature, though, because um, it requires potentially finding out who are the science journalists in your area, who covers the topics coming out of your university. And I think the added benefit of that is that they might be more interested in your research or your colleagues' research, right? They'll, they'll At least it'll be more on their radar. Um, and I think that's often a question because journalists are, I mean, habitually overworked. There's tons of stories they could cover. Um, but if you're a friend of theirs and you can say, hey, there's this interesting thing that th so-and-so is doing, um, just wanted to flag it for you, right? It might increase the likelihood that it is covered, might increase the likelihood that the public gets to know about it. So I don't want to pour ice on this, but my experience has been it's either the corporation counsel for the institution or it's the handlers, the PR folks who put the brakes on scientists approaching anyone or anyone approaching a scientist. I'm not painting with a broad brush and saying that these are bad people. I think they're they're being supremely protective of the interests of their institutions. But I think there needs to be a little bit of flex and uh, more engagement with the media uh, in these areas. And I had a follow up, Samir. Um, one thing that may be lacking in the veterinary profession, if you ask veterinary schools what they do for public media training, it was like, 20 years ago, there were no business classes in veterinary schools, and now it's almost mandatory in most uh, uh, veterinary things. Uh, so it might be something that as a society, we could improve that because we see what the public perceives veterinarians as, but now they don't have training on being that media representative. Um, and that's why Bill won't let me speak for the university. So <laughs> how about you, Adam, anything? 
Not to put you on the spot, but if there is. Um, I'm going to cheat a little and answer or bring up a discussion that was not on camera. So for the audience at home, it didn't happen. Um, but uh, Jessica and I had a nice conversation earlier about um, just sort of the idea of teaching ethics in vet schools. And I've had conversations with um, Candace actually about this as well before she went and decided to get busy by being a vice provost. Um, but uh, I, I do think that there's, um, I, I kind of feel like vet schools and places that uh, involve interacting with animals haven't yet totally cracked the code of how to like effectively teach ethics. Um, and so I would love to see more discussions and collaborations among groups like this about um, ways of trying to, you know, sort of convey um, a shared language that that would be helpful for people to, to have these conversations in the future. Uh, interestingly, do you have a comment about that? I, I, I do too, real quick. Uh, interestingly, we are required to have our graduate students go through ethics courses. Maybe not all our professional students. That's just about the um, question of teaching ethics, um, from what I understand, I don't know personally, the curriculum for teaching ethics in law schools is heavily tilted toward one set of values. So how would you, how do you promote the teaching of ethics that is not teaching one particular set of values. Dr. Schreiber. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that, I mean, I think that is part of the, the challenge because I think I've seen it different, different ways um, at different schools where it, and I mean, this is, well, yeah, like, like part of the problem is that so much of how ethics is taught at a particular school just depends on who happens to be the person teaching it um, and what their views are that, you know, that semester. Um, and um, so I, I, I don't know, I guess I think teaching it as a method of inquiry and as asking questions more than um, coming up with specific conclusions is, is one way to approach it. But um, if, there was, if there was an easy answer like that, it probably would have been implemented by now. So, uh, but I think, I think the idea is just to, hopefully the people who are teaching ethics have um, some humil humility and sort of understand that what they're trying to do is get the students to think critically um, and enjoy grappling with the difficult questions rather than sort of just imparting a set of values on the students. I'd like to make a follow-on comment uh, to what Dr. Shriver just said and what Dr. Wong asked and what Dr. Hanegar reported or Dr. Hatfield reported that Dr. Grandin said about anthropomorphizing and about teaching ethics. I'm just curious, to me, it, it strikes me quite strongly that uh, the animal in research issue uh, seems to be a single issue campaign. And if we're talking about having veterinary students or graduate students, medical students, philosophy students, uh, cogitating about this in an ethics class, you know, it's quite, it's chilly here in DC. And some folks have a goose down coat or some folks you know, might have chicken for lunch. And some people uh, have animals in laboratories who are being monitored right now. I'm just curious why the focus you know, circles around to these with this caution about not anthropomorphizing and this question about teaching ethics and are there a single set of, of values. I think it becomes very confusing when we make these single issue campaigns. Dr. Newsom. Um, to follow up on Candace wanting topics we haven't spoken of, uh, quite interested to hear what the panel has to say about um, 
incorporating this message of animal research into the One Health spectrum. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Kwan talked about doing, uh, you know, parasite work in the field and ecology and bringing it back to the lab and getting it out. Can we use this message to improve our communications or to better explain how we're all interrelated, uh, uh, both in the medical uh, human aspect, the animal welfare, and even the environment. Any thoughts? Uh, so I can comment a little bit about this, and this is from my personal experience being a extern with CDC in their epidemiology elective program, which is a really great program for anyone out there who's a veterinary student or medical student. The idea is to bring us all together in this One Health approach. What a lot of people don't realize with One Health is it actually started more in the veterinary realm and now has sort of expanded out. And there's this misconception that it's all for human benefit. And I think they forget that we are also supposed to take the component of environment into consideration, ecology, all of that. And so I do believe that there is a place where veterinarians can step in, especially the ones who are familiar with research use in animals can bring it out to these greater sort of uh, communities. But how we do that, I think, is we have to go back to basics and we have to not really reclaim One Health, but I think we have to redefine and make sure that we're getting the right message across. Because I think when you say One Health to a veterinary student, we start to immediately think like the ecosystem and the elephants and, you know, and you're really thinking broadly. But when you talk to a medical student about what One Health means to them, they're really thinking about human populations, sort of these countries that may not have access to healthcare. And what does that look like in terms of the disease? What can we do? And it's interesting because then we start to not really agree on where's the value in animals in that realm. And so again, this is long-winded, but it's more so, I think we have to go back to redefining what One Health is, reminding people how inclusive that is of both animals and humans. And I think once we have that conversation and we can connect research animals into that realm, I think we'll have a better understanding. And I think we can really appeal to a lot of people in the healthcare profession, not just, we keep mentioning medical and uh, medical doctors, human and uh, veterinarians, but also the nurses, the pharmacists, anyone who's involved in the healthcare realm. Can I just jump in because I listened to a lecture recently by Jerry Tannenbaum on one health versus one medicine. Okay. And one medicine is where this originated from, which was between animals and humans, mainly tied to health, right? But one health, as he was explaining, is includes now environmental, ecology, planetary health. And so it becomes very diffuse and people get confused over it. And his plea was that we should return to one medicine because it is sort of about the veterinary arena and the human medical arena. And not that we're not worried about the rest of the world, you know, the planetary health and the ecology ecosystems, but we can't do it all. And so he feel he felt the term, and I, he he convinced me at the end that one health was an unhealthy term to be using. And if we went to one medicine, we would be clearer on what we want to do. So. So I wanted to ask a slightly different question. Um, a little while ago, you were talking about ethics and ethical norms, and it struck me as a very US lens. We have a lot of foreign talent in the United States. We have a lot of collaboration with other countries, and there are a lot of countries that don't actually value the lives of animals compared to humans and other things. And so when we're talking about and when we're thinking about uh, how to communicate, how to think about ethical norms, standards, that sort of thing, um, what sorts of things do you think about when you, when you sort of put that international lens on? And, and if uh, this is sort of a, an open-ended question, maybe this goes to Candace's sort of question as well as something that would be useful to follow up on in the future. I could comment real quick uh, while people are thinking, because I've worked globally in Asia, Europe, and the U.S. for many, many years, and um, worked in countries where the rules and regulations sort of choke research, and wor worked in countries where the rules and regulations didn't help the animals. There, you know, they, they, they it was not a good situation, and I think 
what we did, but this would of course have to be at a national level um, or international level is there, and I think there are um, inroads in the OIE and in other groups for this on basic principles of animal welfare and animal experimentation. So, you know, um, <laughs> this may seem silly, but the, they get the right food and the right, you know, potable water, simple things like that, that this cage size fits the needs of the species that are involved. So you'd go to very core principles. So whether the society as a whole has a high level of care and concern or a low level of care and concern, some doesn't really matter because if they're part of the global organizations like the OIE and others, they have to meet those core principles to be part of the worldwide medical area. Yes. Margaret, not everybody may not know what OIE stands for. Can you explain well, it's that? French, and I, I can't, I can't, I can't remember. But it's it's basically a, a, an organization. I don't, I don't remember the French name. So, yeah, I, but OIE is the French version. It's, it's actually OIE. That's what's efficient. Oh, okay. Which is. And, 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 <laughs> We have a couple of comments in the chat that I think are uh, worth putting out. And that is that uh, one participant uh, says that teaching should also be part of like vet tech programs as well as DVM and v VMDs uh, and just other students. And uh, it is included in their curriculum. And, um, and that ethics is taught at virtually all medical schools and it's taught in a way that includes many views and perspectives. And I think that's probably you know, the way that, that we have to think about this. Everybody doesn't think like us always. So um, with that, um, any other questions in the room? Any questions from the panelists? Yes. Well, that's more of a comment rather than Please. a question. And I do respect all perspectives, but I do want to leave another perspective related to One Health and as it relates to communication and scientific um, communication to, you know, just the general public. So I know we talk about medicine, but I, that's just a small aspect of One Health. One Health involves health period. When you think about public health, it's not just medicine. One Health isn't just medicine. That's why we have an ethicist. An ethicist is part of the social science, um, the social science aspect of bringing different principles and values from all societies to talk about what is needed or what people find valuable in a particular situation or a particular group. So that's one aspect. You might have an economic principle. You may have an environmental principle that has to deal with just how things live. What is in that environment that may impact both animals and people that may not even be related to medicine at all, just to their well-being just to their daily life, how they think, how they act, how they behave, how they group. So I think we should kind of think more broadly in aspect of how do we bring all these disciplines to speak about how all these things are interrelated and how do we communicate that so that people have a better understanding of what science is all about. Science isn't just medicine, that's just one aspect. Science is all kind of things, whether it's technology, whether it's, you know, all kind of other principles. So I just want to leave that. Thank and you. If I could just say, Brianna, I agree with you fully. I just have no idea how it gets done. But <laughs> yeah. And to go back to the previous comments, OIE roughly translates to World Organization for Animal Health. Um, and with that, I would like to thank all of our panelists for their time and, and in many cases, their travel. And I would like to pass it back to our chair. So thank you again to everybody who participated, the people who participated in the room, the presenters, the, um, the, the people who participated in the conversations, um, the committee members, all of the National Academy staff, um, and all of the attendees, of course. Um, so today we had some fairly robust discussion about openness. What does it mean? What's the spectrum? Um, what have people experienced? Um, we got some insights into the concerns of institutional leadership. Um, we talked about communicating about ethics, 
learned about communicating on social media. Um, and then we grilled the rest of our panel of presenters some more. Um, and very much appreciate all of you being involved in this. And I hope I, I, I take from this last session that we have lots of more things to talk about. So I hope we can all continue the, the conversation and further improve or yeah, further improve our efforts to communicate effectively. Nia? I'd like to thank you all for attending the effective communication with the general public about scientific research that requires the care and use of animals workshop. We are at the close of our workshop and I would like to express my gratitude to each and every one of you for your participation and contributions to the discussions that we've had over the last two days. The insights and perspectives shared over the last two days have been invaluable in, in advancing our understanding of ways to effectively communicate about research that involves the use of animals. I would encourage each and every one of you to continue the discussion started here as we continue the work of learning to communicate effectively. If you are interested in viewing the recording from the workshop, it will be available through the link on our National Academy's webpage. And as a reminder, under the meeting materials tab, there are resources related, uh, organized by topic. You can access this directly by scanning the QR code found at the top of the meeting book. And I would like to say thank you again to everyone for your interest and your attendance. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.